today is uh, Mary McIntyre. Uh, I have been following Mary since the beginning of this year, and I've discovered just this incredible volume and wealth of, of YouTube videos, uh, web uh, discussions, uh, blogs, presentations at Astronomy Club, incredibly productive person. She's an amateur astronomer, and she's an astronomy communicator that, uh, based in uh, Oxfordshire, England. She's uh, self-described as a keen astrophotographer. Someone asked her in, in one of the interviews I saw whether or not she's a professional astronomer, uh, and she said a uh, keen astrophotographer. But, but she really does a lot of sketching and uh, teaching astronomy. She's passionate about astronomy outreach, so much so that in uh, 2021, the British Astronomical Association uh, named, gave her the uh, Sir Patrick Moore Prize. So congratulations on that. Mary, what, a, what an incredible uh, impact he's had on our, our field. Uh, she has a very uh, busy talks fellow. She uh, schedules, she is a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society, and she regularly contributes to the uh, Sky at Night magazine in the Yearbook of Astronomy. She's a co-presenter of the Comet Watch radio show and a panel, panel member on the uh, Space Oddity show. Uh, if you visit her website, you'll see, or her YouTube channel, you'll see some phenomenal interviews and a lot more about her. But we want to hear Mary. You don't want to hear me. So, Mary, if you would take it over. Hi. Well, thank you so much. I always sound very grand with that introduction, but I'm very down to earth, I promise. <laughs> I'm just going to share my screen with you. Um, I'm so glad you asked me to do the Star Trails talk because this is one of those things I love to share because as astrophotography goes, or this is I guess classed as nightscape, it's actually quite straightforward to do with really simple equipment. All of my equipment is budget. So every picture you see tonight was taken with one of the bottom of the range digital SLR cameras that's about 10 years old. So um, first of all, I live in Oxfordshire UK. I'm from Lancashire, but I now live in Oxfordshire with my husband and we have a roll off reef observatory and a second telescope here because my husband and I can't agree on how to do astrophotography. So we need one each, then we don't argue. <laughs> and we've got six telescopes between us. So we're really well set up for doing kind of deep space photography and the, all the usual targets, really. My husband goes for the more unusual stuff. I like to go back to the, the big favourites because I just love them so much. But um, as you heard, I also do astronomy sketching and creating um, astronomy artwork using pastels. So this is just a small example of some of the drawing that I do. Um, so, yeah, there's loads of pictures of that on my website. But tonight we're talking about star trails, which, as I said, is one of my absolute favorite things to do. There is a full PDF summary of this. So if you do watch it back, don't try to take notes or anything. I will make sure the full PDF summary is available for all of you guys who want to download it. I spend time writing it so you guys can have it as far as I'm concerned. So in terms of equipment, as I said, my cameras i now have four of them and they keep breeding but i've got four canon 1100ds and for many years all i ever used was the kit lens which is not the best quality lens but for star trails it's fine you can use 50 mil lens but i tend to go for as wide a field of view as possible i used to have one of those fish eye screw on attachments which are not great for most astronomy purposes but they will work for star trails but a couple of years ago i finally invested in a a, a budget wide angle um, lens which works really well for me a tripod absolutely essential because you're going to be imaging for a long time to even if it's only 20 minutes the tripod needs to keep your camera still a remote shutter cable absolutely essential for this as well because you can lock it in place leave your camera taking pictures and walk away from it and just leave it doing its thing in terms of budget dew heater those disposable or reusable hand warmers and an old sock is all you need for that that's great and if you are gonna get like me and start getting competitive with yourself for going longer and longer with your star trails a mains power camera adapter is really helpful not essential by any means if you've got a decent battery they will keep you going for a few hours but if like me you get competitive with yourself then mains power is quite helpful 
So when we look at a star trails pointing north, we can see that the stars kind of paint out these concentric rings. And this is my longest single star trail session. And that was 11 hours, 50 minutes. That last 10 minutes was just too light to include in the stack. So can't quite get to 12 hours here without too much of the dawn light breaking in. But what you're capturing there is not really the stars moving. It's Earth rotating on its axis. And because the pole star, Polaris, is almost above the North Pole, if you point your camera towards the North Celestial Pole, you get those lovely little circles being painted out. And the further away from the north you go, the faster the stars will move. And that's something that you can use to your advantage, which I'll talk about in a minute. If you have 24 hours of darkness, like you do at the poles in winter, they will form full circles. And ever since I saw this picture in 2012, I've wanted to attempt to recreate this from a location that doesn't have 24 hours of darkness. I will come back to that towards the end. So when you first have a digital SLR or a bridge camera, your first thought is, why don't I just do one single long exposure of however long? Even like if we've got portal four skies here, so we're relatively dark compared to a lot of the UK. This is a 20 minute single shot from a fairly dark location. The stars are hardly showing up, loads of background light pollution getting picked up, and it's just not great. But there are some other um, disadvantages to doing it in a single shot like that aside from needing a really dark sky even then you're going to end up with the background very washed out and you're not going to see the stars too well because you're going to be exposing for a really long time you'd have to push the iso right down which straight away gets rid of any faint stars so you're only going to get the brightest stars not ideal at all this is a crucial one if you have a low flying aircraft or a neighbor's security light comes on during that exposure the entire image is ruined so that could be 45 minutes of work just lost because of one event so that's not great either so i use image stacking and this is not the kind of stacking where you have to learn about algorithms and darks and flats and all of that stuff we're talking about simple free software here that is genuinely the easiest piece of software to use because you're just going to be stacking you can bring your exposures to be a much shorter time period which means you can push the iso up a little bit and capture more stars so you're going to get more of those faint stars and you can adjust that for your light pollution level and i have friends that have done star trails photography in central london and you can still pick up some stars that means you can keep going all the time it's dark and produce very long star trails and if you do adapt it for your light pollution level you can do a really long trail from somewhere that has light pollution which is great star stacks is the one i'm going to show you how to use tonight and it's free of charge and it genuinely is so so easy to use but this is the absolute game changer for me if you are doing for example 30 second shots and an aircraft flies through you untick it from the stack and it will automatically fill the gap for you it's not cheating because you did take the picture you just haven't included it and that for me is great because we have a lot of neighbors that are fond of security lights here we are also on the direct flight path to oxford airport so that is really great for me to be able to do it so high level aircraft trails i'm completely okay with my record was 28 in an hour we have busy airspace here so i'm completely fine with that but when you get the really low ones coming in that can kind of ruin the vibe a little bit also if you are somewhere residential and cars drive past you can get lens flares on the inside of the camera and that's also not ideal this water tower was in the middle of a residential estate which has now been knocked down sadly the, the water tower not the houses um but having these like people driving home at night after work with the car headlights were causing problems so you can just get rid of those and the stacking software will fill it in for you just as a comparison the first time i tested star stacks i did a 20 minute um point in north just like i did with the other one there is no comparison here they are so different the blue here is because there was a bit of moonlight but also i like blue so i tend to um, enhance the blue a bit more than some people like but it's down to personal taste really but the, the thing to take away here is look at how many stars you're getting and also this is a decent star trails picture and it's only 20 minutes long so i will be showing you some examples that have been done for much longer but don't think you have to kind of aim for that because you don't 
I'm going to go through the camera settings that I find work for me. And the first thing, unfortunately, is your camera is going to have to be in full manual control, and that includes focus. So that can be a bit daunting but if you let the autofocus do it and a moth flies through the foreground it's going to refocus on that and then everything will be out of focus and it will be terrible so manual focus is not as hard as you might think um one thing to keep in mind is particularly with budget digital slrs and budget lenses like i have infinity is too far and in the old days infinity was where you focus the lens but now they go to infinity and beyond. So what you need to do is use the live view screen, point at something bright, zoom in times 10 and start fiddling with the focus. And when it's out of focus, you won't see anything at all, but you'll get that blurry blob that shrinks down. And I rock back and forth around the focus, just overshooting that way, overshooting that way again. And that way you can make the focus as tight as possible. So point at the brightest star you have, whether at the moment we have Jupiter in the evening skies here, which is phenomenal for this because it's really bright. The wider angle the lens is, the smaller the stars are. So this can be tricky with a wide angle lens, but when Jupiter's here, it's no problem. If Venus is here, no problem. So that takes a little bit of getting used to but once you can do that you can do any kind of astrophotography with a digital slr genuinely if you can nail the focusing manually you can do anything so that's the only tricky bit really the rest of it is fairly straightforward so as i said i always use a shutter cable so i can control the camera without touching it if you don't have one or you can't plug one in you can use the timer delay function because the camera will shake when you push the button it gets very very tedious very quickly i've done it when i've took the wrong camera and i got a camera years ago and i managed to snap this off actually inside the camera so i now can't power it with a, a shutter cable picked up the wrong camera in a rush stood there pressing the button and after 20 minutes i'm like i'm done i can't do this they cost about five pounds here in the uk they are really inexpensive to get the basic ones so just buy one they are absolutely worth it and um, in terms of settings generally i go with the lowest f number that the lens will go down to because that opens up the iris the most and it will let the most amount of photons in within a particular time frame so with my wide angle lens i can go down to f 4.5 the kit lens will do 3.5 some of the higher kind of price bracket wide angle lenses will go much much faster than that you don't need to anything around 3.5 4.5 is absolutely fine for star trails in terms of iso um in the old days i did everything at either 3200 or 1600 because we have skies dark enough to take it the downside to that is stars are point sources of light so if you go too high with the iso they overexpose very quickly and just become white and you lose all the star color in the star trails and that's one of the things that i think looks really beautiful beautiful so now i always shoot at iso 800 because it just keeps a little bit more of the star color and that is suitable for somewhere that may not have as good a, a kind of situation with light pollution as i do but honestly 400 or 800 will still do the job if you live somewhere that's quite kind of difficult in terms of light pollution make sure your camera is on continuous shooting so when you lock the shutter cable in place it will just continue to take a photograph after a photograph after a photograph and you can walk off and go back in the house where it's warm or just do something else just leave the camera alone so you don't accidentally knock the tripod um in terms of shutter speed you can create star trails with anything really from five seconds upwards i've, I've done it with stuff from five seconds, eight seconds, 15 seconds, but you end up with a lot of pictures. And if you don't have a particularly good laptop or a very good memory card or not a very high capacity memory card, you're gonna fill stuff up super quickly. So 30 seconds is um, a really good kind of middle ground for me. It's the longest you can go without going into bulb, which will just do one continuous exposure. We don't want to do that, but it's also a smaller gap to fill. You can program the more fancy shutter cables like the intervalometer type ones to actually take like one minute or two minute or three minute shots 
But if you have a problem in one of them and you have to exclude it, that's too big a gap for the software to fill in. So if I am going out with the intention of doing star trails, it's always 30 second shots for me. And that just keeps the number to a kind of reasonable rate. You still get a lot if you get competitive like I do, but it's not as bad as doing eight second shots like I did with the purses. I had 6,000 pictures overnight on the peak of the purses. It's a lot of pictures to try to stack. Turn off your flash because the stars are a long way away. You definitely don't want your flash going off. And if you're with other people that are dark adapted, they really won't be happy with you having your flash on. And also people often ask me about tracking. You can use trackers in reverse to try to speed up the star trails. And I've never tried that myself. But basically, you want to capture the star movement on your pictures. So you don't need any tracking. You just need a static tripod that's completely still. The only thing to decide then is on composition. So there's a, a few different things you can do. If you want those concentric rings, you need Polaris at the center. If you're kind of in a hurry, the stars move quicker in a given time period if you're not pointing at the celestial pole. So it may be better for you to point the opposite direction. And I'll show you some pictures comparing those. Also, think about foreground interest because that makes the image much more appealing especially if you sell photographs how long are you willing to sit on location in the cold doing this that's another factor to consider and also don't be tempted to always have your tripod at eye height i always used to do that but sometimes if you've got an interesting building or a structure and you drop the tripod down to the lowest it will go it gives you a different angle it makes the thing your your foreground thing looks more ominous that way it just kind of it gives a really nice vibe so experiment with different tripod heights once you get into this now you guys are astronomers you will all know that the plough or the big dipper asterism within ursa major points directly at polaris it's the next star you'll see with the naked eye so if you're not an astronomer that is how you find the celestial pole most people can recognize these seven stars so even if you know nothing about astronomy you can find the celestial pole by pointing the camera kind of a little bit above where the plough is at the summertime, but the plough will obviously be upside down at other times of year. Polaris is too faint for you to see on the back of the camera in live view or through the viewfinder. So you're going to have to take a few test shots just to make sure it's in the right place. Now, I'm going to go through a couple of different exposure lengths to show you. So this is one hour, and this is more than long enough to get a nice circumpolar star trail. If you've got something in the foreground that is kind of in some way associated with Polaris or pointing at it or in conjunction with it, it really just kind of adds that appeal to the pictures. This is the shot that has 28 um, aircraft trails in it, by the way, in an hour. I still haven't beaten that record. This was taken in France. This is three hours. And this is an example of where I used the really low cost wide angle lens attachment on my kit lens. The, the poor thing about them is that the stars are not in focus at the outer edges. But if stars are slightly out of focus, they're more colorful. And in a star trail situation, having broader, more colorful star trails in the outside of the image, going down to really tight, kind of lighter star trails in the center, I actually think adds something to the image. Any other application, this would be a nightmare. You'd just crop it out. But for star trails, I think it works. And so if you don't have the budget for a decent wide angle lens, try one of these because I actually like the out of focus colorful stars at the edges. Not everyone will, but I think they're nice. So that's what three hours looks like. This is what 11 hours, 50 minutes looks like. So it's almost half a rotation there. You really don't have to go for 12 hours to do this. As you saw at the beginning, 20 minutes is actually enough to show the movement. So just go with as long as you feel comfortable with. You know, you don't don't feel that you've got to start getting into these crazy long sessions. Now, this is a two hour star trails, but pointing to the east. So you can see that Polaris would be on the upper left of this picture. You've got kind of more straight trails here. The celestial equator, actually, you have straight line trails rather than curving around the, the poles. These stars move more in a given time period. So if your time is restricted, point east or 
west and you will actually get more movement within a limited time period this is two hours looking west above our weather station and i really like these views i really love to point away from the pole sometimes i think it just gives you a bit of variety but as i said before if you point to the south this is with a wide angle lens you can see here you've got that slight curvature towards the south celestial pole at the bottom the star trails in the middle are going in straight line so this is looking directly at the celestial equator that's as high as it gets for us here in the uk but it gives you a very very different view this is bits of thin cloud by the way don't let thin cloud stop you doing star trails because the stars will shine through um if you don't like orange stripes in your picture just take the color saturation down honestly it's fine so the only reason this was seven hours long is because it was a meteor shower night so you know you don't need to do that if you have a monument or a landmark that you are really fond of don't be afraid to experiment with different angles on it because if you stand on four different sides of a water tower for example sometimes you've got circumpolar sometimes you're looking at the celestial equator gives you a very different feel the whole movement in these pictures is very different sometimes it's great to be up close with that object and this on the right here was one time where i had the tripod very low looking up at it um, but also doing those things wide field can be nice as well so that there were all these houses here as you can see and this picture ended up being one of my favorites mostly for reasons that were completely accidental i love the wide field angle i love this aircraft turning that gives another layer of movement different from the stars bright satellite trail running this way and then someone drove home and left headlight trails in the bottom and initially i was going to exclude that but i actually really like it so so many things on that picture were accidental but it just shows you sometimes you get the shot you're not expecting but it gives you a different view being back a little bit from that monument or water tower or windmill or whatever equally with this little we have we don't have many of these in the uk so I, I always kind of pretend i'm in the usa when i photograph this it's about four miles from my house and these poor people have had me outside their house many times but i just love this little wind turbine and when the wind's pointing different ways or if you place yourself on different sides of it you get very very different results they have promised i can go on land and get a circumpolar from this wind turbine um, but i haven't done it yet so if you're going to be and um, once you've got all your composition make sure your tripod can't move and that means protecting it from pets we have five cats they love headbutting tripods so i need to do something to entice them away from the tripod but i normally hang a battery pack or my camera bag off the hook on the bottom and that just stabilizes it a bit and that really helps now as i said before having um a, a kind of budget option for a g band is really helpful because the worst fogging up I've ever had was actually in summer. It's not just a winter phenomenon. And if the lens gets fogged up, that's game over. Your pictures are useless. You can't tease anything out of them. So there's two ways to do this. First of all, cut the end off a sock, activate your hand warmers, just squeeze them in the side, either side of the lens. Do that before focusing though, because you will knock your focus out putting that on. If you wanna get a bit more fancy, there's um, one of my Sky at Night DIY articles that I've written shows you how to kind of make a slightly fancier one with Velcro where you can kind of carefully remove it, change the hand warmers, put it back on without nudging the focus. But honestly, just cutting the end off a sock works a treat. So don't feel you have gotta start over engineering things, it works honestly fine for a few hours the other thing you can think about is if you have a torch um star stacks is really good for not kind of adding too much light on top of light it's not doing the sorts of things that deep sky stacker does so if you have a foreground that is illuminated so if a security light comes on and lights up the trees in the stack, the foreground will stay lit, but if it comes on 15 times, it won't ever get brighter than the brightest shot. But you can use that to your advantage with light painting. So sometimes I will light paint on just one image and then I'll stack it with and without it just to see how it looks. And I love looming silhouettes in my foreground, but I do also love an illuminated tree. So it's kind of good. You only need to do it on one frame and include it and that'll be it. It'll be illuminated for the stack. So 
this is something you can play with with different colors and stack them and then just uncheck the light painted one and stack again and just see what your favorite one is and it's usually all of them for me now as i said star stacks is super easy to use and i'm going to show you some screenshots of how to use it so it's free to download it runs on windows mac and linux so it's a very inclusive app as far as operating systems go open star stacks and um, select all of your images drag and drop them so i love that it has drag and drop so you don't have to do file open this will give you your list of images if any of these just have a quick look through them first and if any of these images are the ones that have got a security light or an aircraft you don't want in just untick it from the list and it'll exclude it from the stack um so it's really good for just being able to quickly kind of uncheck things but the actual reviewing each image is quite slow in this app so i always do that first in um, fast stone image viewer over on the right here you want to make sure that you've got gap filling as your blending mode and if you want to make a time lapse video i don't have time to go into that tonight um but it is in the pdf handout but the crucial thing you need for that is to save your cumulative files and put them in a different folder because the cumulative files it will save it each time it adds a new image so the star trail gets longer and longer and longer as you scroll through and that will allow you to do a star trails time lapse but you don't want to mix up your cumulative in your ordinary images so save them in another folder then click the stack button um, and that's it. It will just stack it there and then right in front of you. You will immediately see if your tripod's been knocked by a cat because the star trails will have a little step in them. Once you've done that, you just press save and it is literally that easy. If you do want to shoot dark frames, you can do that by sticking the lens cap on and shooting 10 frames with the lens cap on. You just open them by clicking this button here, then you, it will subtract the dark frames, which will get rid of some noise and also your hot and cold pixels. So I do always use darks for star trails and um, just purely for the hot pixel removal because they really annoy me and it takes forever to clone them out. But you don't have to get bogged down with calibration frames as a beginner. You just drag and drop, press stack, press save, job done. That, that's it. So keep it simple when you first start. Um, in terms of image processing, it's also super easy to um, process Star Trails images. So it's not like other kind of image processing where you have to spend as many hours in Photoshop teasing out faint detail. Basically, all I do is a tiny bit of contrast enhancement, not too much because it will darken the background and brighten the stars. But you, if you go too far with that, it's actually unpleasant to look at the, the kind of the boundary between the light and dark is so harsh that it's actually not very nice on the eyes. I also correct the color balance, usually too much in favor of the blue, but if you've got light pollution or a thin cloud that looks very orange or pink on your pictures, you basically just cool that down a little bit, just nudge it so that it's a little bit bluer or take the red tones out. And I do all of this in Fast Stone Image Viewer, which is free and phenomenal. Um, you can then boost the color saturation a little bit to just bring out the star color. But again, the stars are subtly colored. They're not day glow marker pens so less is definitely more with that um fast stone image viewer has a fantastic noise reduction so if you haven't been able to shoot dark frames or you don't want to get bogged down with that the noise reduction function in fast stone is really good and it will give you a nice smooth background and does a really good job and then if you've shot this with a wide angle lens get creative with the cropping to get different feels you know i'm very much a believer in cropping images i think you can do some really cool stuff so just as an example of, of some things that i've processed here this um was the first time i visited the wind turbine i ended up cropping out this bush because in 30 seconds every time a lorry went past it was shaking all over the place so it was really blurry and it wasn't stationary in any of my single shots at all to even blend it in but just a little bit of um kind of color saturation changing and changing the color temperature has kind of got rid of some of the pink that you can see here but that's without any cropping just very very subtle changes here then you can play around with monochrome or sepia colored stuff and that again gives everything a 
completely different feel so it just depends what you're going for and i love all of these equally i can't pick a favorite here i like them all the other thing i did is i took the step of cloning out the telegraph wire that was running across the image because i felt this one was worth doing that with we have a lot of telegraph wires everywhere in the uk so they tend to get in a lot of pictures but on this one it was worth taking that extra step i think with this one you've got led lighting in this little village and there was a little bit of kind of ordinary pink light pollution just make it probably too blue but i like it that's all that matters and then you can crop out just the top region if you want to just basically all from one kind of portrait orientation picture this one i love the the kind of wide field water tower in color especially with the colored kind of light trails but i really love it in black and white as well so you know i i end up sharing both versions because i just can't choose between them sometimes an image is screaming at you to desaturate it i never shoot in black and white though because shooting in black and white you can't put the color back in but if you shoot in color you can make it black and white it's not like exactly the same as black and white photography but it's near enough and it gives you more flexibility so if you've got a, a wide field kind of circumpolar star trails like this you can crop it in different ways put in polaris at the different thirds boundaries or making a kind of panoramic crop of it it looks really really good and if your focus is good you can crop pretty tight with these images and you can just create untold different variations of that picture just by cropping it in different places and um, whenever i have been shooting anything with my camera in the same direction i will stack it to try to get some star trails out of it so this was a night we had beautiful noctilucent clouds and also comet neo wise so i stacked all the pictures so there's a big stack of noctilucent clouds here and then i blended it with a single shot of the comet because that was obviously smeared and i love this picture even though the star trails are all over the place i still really love it we do occasionally get really nice aurora displays here at 52 degrees latitude if the sun's very active and on this night i'd been photographing aurora for a while this is only again about a 20 minute um stack but having the stacks of all the aurora pillars with all the star trails in the background as well gorgeous so if ever you shoot aurora time lapses just take the images and stack them in star stacks and you will get star trails out of them it's just really easy to do now i mentioned my um kind of love of that 24 hour star trail that i showed you at the beginning i had this idea that if i put my camera in exactly the same place and took long exposure star trails throughout different times of the year that i would be able to merge them all together to make a 24 hour star trail hands down the most difficult thing i have ever done i had to abandon it three times and start over then last year i was in april and i thought i've just missed the window to get that last chunk and i was close to full meltdown i did the star trails anyway got them all together turns out i am really rubbish at putting my camera in exactly the same place and also trees grow throughout the year so putting something biological in the foreground was a really bad idea but with many many hours of process I finally have my 24 hour star trail. If you do this, just bolt your camera shoe to something so you know that it's pointing the same way because this was so hard. Now, there are a number of reasons this doesn't look like they're forming full circles, and that's due to brightness differences because of moonlight differences on the different sessions. But if you zoom in, you can see that it does make a full circle. And where the star trails overlap, they're brighter. So that is why there are these patches that look brighter and look like they're not complete circles. But if you zoom in properly, every single circle is a complete circle it just doesn't look like it I want to repeat this and do a better job but I can't face it at the moment I finished this a year and a half ago I'm still traumatized by the experience but it was completely worth it and if you want to know how to do that step by step the October Sky at Night magazine is featuring this as a DIY project so have a look out for that the other thing that I've done that is a little bit more creative that I've dubbed the mandala stack is to again i did this with comet neo wise take pictures continuously but then take every 15th picture or every 30th picture and just stack those so you end up with gaps between the stars but they still form these beautiful 
kind of lines but dotted lines and then when you've got a comet in the field of view as well that's great because you can see the comet changing relative to the background stars as the night goes on so it's a really creative way of using the same data so just make the most out of every set of data that you've captured so other uses for star stacks well, i love this program so much i used it when i was in the usa five years ago today for the total eclipse we had four digital slrs running the wide field digital slr basically that was a picture every five minutes and then three around totality all stacked with star stacks international space station transits record it with a high-speed video camera extract the frames with pip stack them with star stacks does a great job meteor showers all i did for the person this year every picture that had a meteor in it just stacked those so the stars aren't stacked on each other you can see the dotted lines there but it just shows up the meteors really well so quick to do absolutely so quick to do if you love photographing fireworks star stacks is absolutely great for stacking those as well and lightning photography i love doing lightning photography and when you get multiple lightning strikes in the same field of view and the camera has been completely stationary you can stack those pictures as well so i will leave it there because i think we're just about to 40 minutes so um we've um got time for some questions if anyone has any so that was really quick to whiz through that so i'm sorry for that i wanted to squeeze as much in as i could chris Cavey has a question if chris if you want to unmute and uh, ask that yeah, thank you, Dan. Mary, thank you so much. Those those final photos you showed were just astounding. In fact, when my wife heard you talking about the meteor shower, she ran over to take a look and see see what that photo looked like. Um, I've now got a high bar. Um, but a uh, simple question. When you shoot your um, star trails, are you shooting in RAW or JPEG? And does StarStacks work with the RAW files of various camera manufacturers? Um, Starstax does not work with raw files, but it will work with TIFF files, so you can convert them, and you can do that with FastStone. But in all honesty, I do them in JPEG because if you're doing, if like me, you're going to start getting competitive and doing this for 12 hours, each raw file off my camera is about 15 megabytes but when you convert it to a full res TIFF, it then becomes 80 megabytes and if you've got 2,000 of those to stack, that that's a lot of processing power in your laptop. It, it just fills memory cards, it fills hard disk space. And in all honesty, for the size of prints that I get done, JPEG works fine. More important is to do dark frames because that will smooth out anything that you're gonna get from JPEG compression. It's one of the very few times where I say JPEG is okay. Um, and I'm a big believer in shooting raw. And if you are gonna do this and print it huge, it's worth doing it in raw. But for day to day, just sharing online, JPEG is fine. Super, thank you. Okay. Hey, Mary, this is Chris. Um, I know we, we talked uh, before the presentation and I would just wanna repeat it for all the other folks. Uh, uh, I had seen some people doing much longer exposures in bulb mode. And I think your explanation was worth, is worth touching on again uh, about taking shorter exposures and filling in the gaps because there's nothing worse than spending hours doing something to have that gap. So I, I definitely had seen some like eight seconds, like you said, all the way to three minutes. And now I realize, oh, I'm not gonna do three minutes um because that creates a risk that that with the you know the planes coming through you know uh, what if something happens with the camera uh, who knows right so I, I just wanted to say okay i got that out of the <laughs> i got i figured that that was really good and yeah you're you're all the different um aspects of things that you shot in with the star trails is really interesting um and gives a lot of uh you know, what's, there's a lot more artistic nature to this. And I, I just wanted to say, I appreciated that all the different views you showed there. Um, Thank you. Yeah, it is. I think it's an artistic art form. And, you know, star trails are just star trails. If there's nothing in the foreground, it's just star trails. And I love that. Mm -hmm. But but it just like that mandala stack was something that blew my mind. Was, mm -hmm. it, not everybody likes it, but 
you know, the internet is a, a rough place. People will always criticize what you put out. But if I like it, that's all that matters. I, I, I don't put stuff online to gain likes. It's nice if people do like yeah. it. But if I've put work into it and like it, that's what I judge it on. And is my Star Trolls this time better than the last one? If the answer is yes, I'm happy. So the trolls can say what they like about it. But I really love the Mandala stacks. I think they're gorgeous. And um, it's fewer images to stack, but I think it's a really strong striking result especially if you've got a comet in the foreground which we don't have very often <laughs> yeah uh one other quick question uh i've seen you shoot on auto white balance or do you shoot a specific color temperature i know you said you like black blue in the background but i, I saw somebody mention 4000 uh k and uh normally i shoot auto white balance but i just wondered if you had played around with that that uh and found a uh, particular color that you liked um, generally, I do it on auto, mostly because I completely forget to set it on one thing. <laughs> um, and the problem there is, you, you may have seen this if you, any of you have watched my kind of Star Trails time lapses, you'll see the colour switches halfway through because the camera suddenly decided it's going to now go to the cloudy setting. Um, so it, it is, if you're in RAW, it doesn't matter because that's all the JPEG artifact anyway, so it, you, you can do what you want to the RAW file. But if you're in JPEG and you want them to look the same, it's definitely definitely worth picking your favorite one and sticking with it. I just so like never 4,000 would be great there then probably yeah. to do that. So, okay, good to and know. Good it to know. Kind of, it'll tone down some of the redness that you get with low cloud or like thin cloud that comes through because that mm -hmm. always looks pink when you, if you, if you're anywhere within 50 miles of a city, lower thin cloud is going to look pink. So, you know, it just helps to get rid of that. Thanks. There is a lot more detail in the notes, by the way, which I will I will give you a link that you can download from my Dropbox. So if anybody does want that, we'll um, I guess we can put that in the description on the YouTube video, can't we? Yeah, if you send me send me the link, Mary, um, I'm I'm cc'd at the info at ahsp.org, so I get those emails. So if you send me that link, um, I will post this with a video. Cool. Now, I'm, I, if, if there are no questions more. instantly, I was just going to quickly say that when you save the cumulative files, if you want to make a video, all I do is drag them into PIP, which is a planetary pre-processing tool, but it's really good for time lapses. Drag them, drop them into PIP, create a time lapse using the cumulative files and the star trails will paint out against the background sky. And it's so easy to do, but they are incredibly effective and it's it's super easy you just need to remember to tick the save cumulative files box that's all you need to do and then just use the cumulative files to make the video and it's really cool really really cool mary what was the name of the um uh, the in the photo processing software you were referring to fast stone I've, image viewer fast stone okay i'm not familiar with fast that. stone no it's it's free and it is phenomenal i it's my go-to for everything i love it i really do i would pay for it and I, I shouldn't tell them that but i would happily pay for that software and i'm really tight when it comes to software but i would genuinely i would give them my money for that i love it so much <laughs> can you say a little more about how you anchor your tripod um, yeah, so my tripod was the princely sum of £14, so it's not a, a particularly heavy-duty model, but I need something that's lightweight. Um, if it's got a hook on the underside of it, um, just hang your camera bag or if you've got a battery pack or just anything heavy, take a pack of potatoes out with you in a carrier bag and hang that off. It doesn't matter as long as there's something a little weighty. If conditions are windy or like my wind turbine, you are like literally 10 feet from a main road, didn't factor that in when I set up to do those images. Um, basically, keeping the tripod as low as possible will minimize how much it moves. So it's another benefit of having the tripod super low to the ground. The higher something is, the more it's going to shake when it's windy. So if the conditions are not favorable from that perspective, have something heavy underneath and then keep the tripod low and that will help to keep it still um dogs with waggy tails that's going to knock it flying my cats when they're chasing each other around they'll knock it flying so just try to mitigate that as much as possible and you know keep pets indoors if you can because it is heartbreaking when you've 
kind of done an eight hour star trail and halfway through the tripod nudges and you can't stack them all because there's a big step in the star trail so it is really annoying when that happens but you know sometimes wildlife i'll leave my camera um sometimes while i'm sleeping um in a secure place we have foxes in the garden sometimes hedgehogs so sometimes you, the wildlife will give it a bit of a kick there's nothing you can do about that but the heavier the thing is that's holding the tripod down the better or a bungee you can bungee it with a, a stake in the ground that will do it as well i've seen on your website you also have a series of uh, meteor cams set up in your garden uh, have you, you know that that's a, a, a much more smaller camera capability and all that? Have you tried doing star trails with that that kind of gear? Because that's that's pretty uh, low tech compared to what you're doing with the DSLRs. <clears throat> Oh, so the, the meteor cameras are all run on Raspberry Pis and they're running, it, it's part of the global meteor network actually. We have the UK meteor network here that we're involved with, but the cameras are set up by the global meteor network, which I think was set up in um, over either USA or Canada. But the Raspberry Pi, and they're all run off RMS, which is a free piece of software, which is Python based. and every night it will stack every capture well actually it catches all night long unlike the old style um, meteor cameras so every morning when i wake up there is already a stacked image waiting for me to have a look at that and then what it also does is a track stack so it will stack on the stars so then if there's like during the persids the camera pointing at the radiant you can clearly see the radiant of all the meteors that are kind of coming out from that and if you go to my youtube channel the the last video I posted was kind of like a roundup of the Persage and you'll see what I'm talking about because I share the pictures from our meteor cameras. So they basically do all that work for you. I'd literally get up in the morning, watch the time lapse videos on YouTube, which have gone there automatically to my husband's channel. And then on his website, there is then a stacked image and a stack of every meteor capture of this entire month to date so that keeps adding and adding and adding more and more meteors and then you've got the track stacks so it takes out any work essentially so if you like doing stuff it's kind of nice to have some data to play with because that does it all for you so you don't have to do anything really <laughs> they're great i love them but i always have a digital slr running as well have you tried using a uh, gopro i haven't no I should, um, but I, I've, I've seen people do it, so it can be done. Okay, we're, we're getting near time here. Any, any last questions? Mary, the, what an amazing presentation. Your, your images, uh, your enthusiasm, uh, the, the work you're doing, so impressive. Thank you so much Thank for you. participating with us today. It's an absolute honor to be part of your star party. So thank you for asking me. So I'm, I'm really sorry that you guys are missing out on Uncle Rod this year, but I hope you enjoyed that. And yeah, next year, hopefully he'll be back. Yeah, that was outstanding. I want to second that, Mary. And thank you so much for joining us. You were tremendous today and I love your energy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Enjoy the uh, images and the talk. Excellent.